Welcome, welcome again. Welcome again to the future of Judaism. Yes, we are now on our session number six. We're passed through the middle and we're going to get right through the topic of today, which is building bridges, creating unity within our Jewish diversity. I'm so happy to have you all here tonight. Uh, please remember, put your name uh, on the... Um, on the Zoom, so we know who you are. If you're asking questions and everything, we want to know who you are. So thank you everyone for coming. We're starting sharp today. So David, please take it away. No, I know you couldn't hear me, forget it. Now you can hear me. I have too many buttons I have to remember to press, I apologize. Hi everybody, I was just saying hello. It's good to see all of you. Um, I'm very excited about today. I'm very, very passionate about this topic and I'm eager to learn. I'm really eager to learn. We have two amazing guests today. Before I allow them to introduce themselves, very quickly I want to remind you that if you want to be a part of this conversation, and yes, we hope you do want to be a part of this conversation, please, 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 please click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom window. If you don't see it, go over to the More button and then you'll find Q&A in there and that's where you can ask questions um, and that I will relate to our panelists. Um, if you can't find it, you can throw stuff in the chat. I'll do my best to keep an eye on it, but the Q&A is the best place to put it. And the uh, second thing that I wanted to start with, which is what we always start with, is bring them home now. Friends, I'm so, so excited to introduce to you our two guests today. Um, I'm going to let each of them do their own thing, and maybe Denise will start with you, if that's okay. Sure. Um, thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. My name is Denise Latow. I am the current chair of the JCRC in Broward County, as well as the chair for the Alsi Hastings Black Jewish Alliance. Both are part of Jewish Federation in Broward County. Hi, everybody. Oh, oh, yes, Audra, please. you're I up was going to introduce myself. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I am Audra Berg, and I am the president and CEO of the Jewish Federation of Broward County. And do, do you, Audra, maybe we'll just start with you. What is, what is in your role, what is community? Mm -hmm. what, is, what is the nature of community? Why, why is it important to you? Right. So I'll start by saying something that always um, gives people a shock, which is that the Jewish Federation, and maybe some of you are involved with us or were involved with Jewish, one of the other 146 Jewish federations across the country, Jewish federations are not fundraising organizations. We are community building organizations. And everything we do is about creating Jewish community. Sometimes we do that by raising money. You know, that's what we're known for but we also do it by building bridges in the community, by being a convener for agency partners that we fund to do all the important social service work in our communities. We bring organizations together and create and build partnerships. We help people engage in Jewish life in whatever way is meaningful to them. Um, and through the very nature of our work, everything is a partnership with volunteers and professional leaders and that builds community as well. And what is your specific role? I mean, what 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 does it mean to build? When you say we're building community, I, I don't mm -hmm. know what that means. What do you mean by that? So that means that we are helping kids have meaningful Jewish experiences by going to camp, by getting PJ library books, by participating in youth group. Um, we are helping seniors who need assistance have someone come to their home weekly and bring them food and and get to know them and become part of our lives that means we are taking care of the 1500 holocaust survivors who live in broward county 750 of them who are considered vulnerable and in need in everything we do we are building bridges between people and our organization and other organizations so Denise, what, for you, what is what does community mean when you think about Jewish community? Okay, Jewish community for me is actually an extension of my spirituality. Um, I actually feel that part of what makes me feel whole is uh, my relationships to other people. 
um, and how we relate to one another clearly and also how we support one another, how we lift one another up. So for me, it has to do with within my Jewish identity. And if we're talking about Federation now, it has to do with us extending a hand to one another. Mostly Federation is known for those in need, but also it's not always when people are in need. It's in general. So the things that Audra mentioned, uh, you know, whether it is fundraising for various uh, disasters, unfortunately, or catastrophes, or whether it is building community in the sense of assisting teens to go to Jewish camps, for example, where that they are, again, extending and being a part of their Jewish identity, their Jewish, extending their Jewish life. So for me, it has a kind of a, a spiritual connotation to it. So I want to ask a big picture sort of philosophical question about what is the nature of community and how has it changed? And let me just, I'll, I'll set the scene for just a moment. And that is to say that uh, up until October 7th, I think that um, the nature of belonging, the idea of belonging in Judaism was undergoing a really significant shift that had been a long time coming and was propelled light years ahead because of the pandemic. We were seeing lots and lots and lots of folks question why they needed needed to belong to a Jewish community, whether that was a, a synagogue or a JCC or a federation or a day school or anything. And there was, there was from where I stood, a big shrinking of, 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 of belonging. Then October 7th happened, and I think we've seen sort of a little bit of an inflation. I think people have, have been yearning to find connection, to feel connection, because we all have felt so alone. And so belonging to something, a Jewish community, um, helps us uh, um, deal with that darkness. So, so I'm curious, uh, number one, am I right? And I hope I'm not, and I hope that you'll correct me. And number two, that's where we've been, how we have thought about belonging. What's next? What's going to be next? What do you imagine coming down the pike next vis-a-vis -vis Jews and their wanting to, needing to, yearning to belong? Mm -hmm. um, Denise, do you want to start for us? And then we'll jump over to you, Audra. And if, again, I, I feel free to interrupt and jump in and... Well, already prior to October 7th, the rise in anti-Semitism was, I think the ADL had a statistic like 360 times what it had been the same time uh, uh, a year ago. Uh, it was already in November, very, very high. I, I mean, uh, I should say September, October, extremely high. And um, so already people were having the sense of needing comfort of, of a community and kind of feeling lost in the sense of quite often you think you have friends or allies and then you discover perhaps you don't. So in a way, people are looking more towards the Jewish community and its various facets, whether it's a shul or a federation or uh, some other institution to find that belonging and to have that sense of safety, because clearly uh, that's one of the main issues of how do you feel safe when you feel that you are under attack because of your identity, because of who you are, uh, because of your religious practices. So I do unfortunately think that you are right. Uh, unfortunately, that that is true, I think. But I the good news, I think, is people are banding together and uh, supporting one another during a very, very difficult time. Audra, do you have any thoughts? We are seeing a significant uptick in people who are interested in engaging, in engaging in Jewish life now. So we are finding that this is a time where people are looking for community and looking to come together. Um, we have our largest community event in a month and it's already been sold out for a week. We're doing a series of parlor meetings. We're doing events at synagogues. And truthfully, 
um, it's inspiring to see how many people are stepping up and waking up to their Judaism, their need to find community. Um, I don't know if that's something that's going to last for a long time or if it's something that's just in this moment now, but it's certainly an opportunity for those of us who work professionally in Jewish life to see this as an opportunity to be in relationship with people. Um, to that end, we are actually launching a community study, which is going to start this fall. And we're going to be training people to be within Broward County, having conversations with all kinds of people who are not engaged in Jewish life to start to understand what it is that motivates them, what they're looking for, what they need help with, how they'd like to be engaged or not be engaged, so that we can start to make more educated and informed decisions about what kinds of programs and engagement opportunities we ultimately fund. You know, we do that a lot. We ask people what they want, and and I, I, I'm I'm not sure I've yet to see a, a a survey that actually gives us an answer that helps us do anything meaningful. But um, I want to go back to something you said earlier. You said I don't know if this is going to last. When you said that, you made me think of something that's been rattling around in my brain. So I'm part of the Temple Sinai of North Dade community here, and we've been doing a lot of stuff around Israel. Um, we've been doing podcasts about it, classes, ra participating in rallies, you know, all the stuff that lots of people are doing. What we haven't been doing is marketing the heck out of that. And what I mean by that is I think you're right that people are yearning for connection now. And I've been wondering why haven't we been capitalizing on this moment? Why haven't we been shouting from the rooftops, hey, we're the, you know, support Israel, whatever synagogue. If you're looking for a place where you can feel safe in your thoughts about Israel, come over here. We, it, it, I also don't know if it's going to last, but I also wonder, are we missing this moment? Our synagogues, our JCCs, our, our federal, our Jewish communities missing this moment. Are we not capitalizing on this moment mm -hmm. to grab these folks? What do you think? Mm -hmm. From where I sit, we are not missing this moment. We are taking advantage of every opportunity. Like I said, we're seeing, we're, we've pretty much doubled um, the number of people who are participating in our events. The amount of social media, the amount of cohesiveness and organization in the Jewish community nationally between AJC, ADL, federations, I think has been truly astonishing. So I don't know about your synagogue, but the synagogues here in Broward County, I think are doing great work. Um, and, and we've all been collaborating and working together more seamlessly than I think I've seen in a very long time. By the way, that's a Go ahead, Denise, I'm sorry. No, I've also found that people are really, you know, reaching out, wanting to do things and asking to do things and really initiating a lot of what we have been doing. I mean, people are really wanting to get involved and they want to do something with regard to Israel, whether it's actually volunteering there or even doing something here that's meaningful. So I, I don't see that there's a missing of the moment, but you also have to be delicate with that too. You know, it's... Sure. <laughs> so, sure. but uh, yeah, I think that people really want to get engaged and I don't think that we have to uh, go too far out on a limb uh, in order to inspire people to do things. So, you, Audrey, you, you talk about cooperation. You mentioned cooperation. And this has been another area where I've really struggled in the past. Uh, I'm one of those folks that believes that Every synagogue shouldn't have its own religious school. We should have community religious schools. Um, that that every synagogue shouldn't have its own youth group. We should have community youth groups and events and things like that, because we just we're all fighting over the same you know few morsels, and instead of working together to reach out to the much larger a much larger audience. And I'm I'm curious um, on a com Jewish communal level in both Denise and in the organs orgs that you work in and Audra in, in those that you work in, where have you seen some of this, some of this deeper cooperation? Um, mm -hmm. And, and do you see that continuing? Are we able to build on that? Mm -hmm. So I think you and I have different experiences. 
Um, but I would say one great example is our relationship with uh, the American Jewish community. So Ted Deutsch, who many of you know, who is the CEO of AJC, who comes from South Florida and lives here, um, has really highlighted South Florida as one of the premier communities as part of his taking on the role of CEO for AJC nationally. We have established a very strong relationship to focus on anti-Semitism education within Broward County, the school board, the police department, providing education. Um, and so that's an example of an area where they have a certain level of expertise, additional funding. We have the relationships and we're working together to leverage what we both have to have a greater impact. So that's an example. Um, but I would say federations are historically known for partnering with other significant Jewish organizations. Obviously, we're one of the largest funders in Jewish communal life. Um, and everything is fueled in this country in Jewish life to some degree by a Jewish federation in the local community. So there is no JCC. There are no scholarships for, for uh, synagogue preschools and overnight camps and Holocaust survivors aren't fed if we're not all working together to both raise money and put those dollars into good use. Right. And just to be clear, I'm not, I, I mean, I, I know what the Federation does and it does amazing work. And I guess what I'm asking is that's kind of the Federation, the Federation's job is to collaborate. Like that's why they're there. <laughs> they're mm -hmm. there to bring us together, to help us mm -hmm. work together. So maybe if I phrase the question a little differently is, is is are you seeing it working better not for you in the federation but for the mm -hmm. rest of us for amha aretz that yeah. are out here in the field i think there's a newfound respect for people um, who work and volunteer in jewish communal life and i find that people are a little bit more tolerant now than they were before october 7th and a, and a little bit more willing to be accepting of our differences and collaborating because I think we're all feeling the stress of what we're living through and realizing that ultimately at the end of the day, we only have each other. Denise, did you want to chime in on your experiences? Uh, well, I think they're fairly similar. I, I have found that, and even prior to actually October 7th, there was already a willingness to collaborate that could have been spurred by the rise in anti-Semitism. But um, everyone that we, as we, that I typically come across uh, wants to collaborate and to figure out what we can do together and how we can share resources. And the, the mood has obviously shifted uh, and, and everyone has a desire really to, in good faith, do what's best for the community. So let, let's jump into anti-Semitism since both of you spoke about that for, for just a moment. Um, Robert Brown is asking, is there a Jewish organization in South Florida that is continually interacting with outside groups, for example, local um, and state governments, universities and colleges, other religious, ethnic, or et cetera groups, to educate and collaborate on fight, fighting anti-Semitism and the vicious anti-Israel rhetoric and actions? Mm -hmm. Is there such an organization or multiple organizations? Well, That's what we do. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll let Denise go first. Yeah, I'm just saying that's what the JCRC does. Is it's expressly mm -hmm. um, we spend most of our days collaborating mm -hmm. uh, with folks outside of the Jewish community to build a greater understanding. And I will say, uh, I will share with you that I was last week or was this week at a meeting, uh, and there was a Muslim gentleman there. It was a meeting, an interfaith meeting. Uh, who was complaining that uh, none of the folks there had decided to take a stand against Israel. Um, and I was sitting right next to him. And then somebody said, uh, Denise, what is your, what's your viewpoint, you know, as, as a Jew? And I said, he had no idea I was Jewish, this gentleman next to me. And I said, well, number one, I would have loved for everyone, and I don't mean it in a crass way, but I do believe that if you watch the video footage that's available from October 7th, that that has been shot, that I think the broader community would have a much greater understanding of the way in which mm -hmm. Israelis feel um, the desire to eliminate Hamas. 
uh, and generally why it is such an emotional topic. And I had the opportunity, I could have skirted perhaps that, but honestly, that's what they wanted to talk about. And I was willing to, to go there and it was very much respected. And I did say afterward, let's have, let's have the dialogue about how to move forward so that no more innocent civilians on either side are injured or killed mm -hmm. for no reason. Did let's talk about that, but let's not just generally walk out and say, let's condemn Israel for its actions. And so Robert, we are continuously being confronted and out there in the community with Muslims and Baptists, every variation of Christian you wanna think of, uh, we are having these really hard conversations with everyone mm -hmm. uh, and sharing our thoughts. And that's important because mm -hmm. then they actually, they just don't talk about Israelis or the Jews. They have a person in front of them saying, this is what's happened. This is the way we feel about it. This is the way we would like to move forward. Um, and I'm not a policy expert and I'm not a government official of Israel and I'm not even an Israeli. So my, what I'm allowed to say or should say is fairly limited, but um, it was respected, especially that I was willing actually to, to have the conversation because a lot of people ran out of the room. I'll say that much, so. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if people realize, but the JCRC, which stands for the Jewish Community Relations Council, is a, a part of the Jewish Federation. Right. In Broward, because there are some there are some communities where it's not, but in Broward it is, yeah. So I I remember when I was growing up, we were Jewish so that Hitler didn't win. And that, that was sort of the driving force, right? We were Jewish because, um, because never again. And I distinctly remember wanting a better reason. I remember I, I, I wanted a joyful reason. I, I wasn't comfortable with this idea of, I'm gonna be Jewish because if I don't, terrible things can happen. So this, this sort of resurgence that you're seeing, this, this, this spirit of, um, of cooperation that you're seeing, it's driven in large part, I think, by anti-Semitism, the rise in anti-Semitism and the anti-Israel hatred. Is this, is this the only thing that can bring us together? Is this the only thing that can help us build community? Is it, is it the, these painful moments when we, when we find ourselves as, as perceived victims that we need to band together and prove to ourselves in the world perhaps that you know, we are, we're David against the Goliaths of the world? So I, I, think it, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I think it feels that way right now, but on October 6th, that didn't feel that way, at least not to me. Um, you know, the people in, in my life who are engaged in Jewish community do it as a, as a, an experience and joyfulness. You know, my kids go to an amazing Jewish overnight camp. They go to a Jewish day school. We're part of a wonderful synagogue community. Our friends are Jewish. All of that brings us joy. And, and I see that countless right, times. But, day but in, Audrey, day you out. and I, but we're weird. <laughs> I mean, I, let's just be honest. You, we, we're my kids also went to day school. My kids also mm -hmm. go to Jewish, went to Jewish. Like we're you and I are strange. We're the outliers. We're not the norm. Yeah. So I think in different communities it looks different all over the country. But my kids, I actually only moved to Broward two years ago. I grew up here, but I came here for this job that I have now. Um, I spent twenty five years at the Jewish Federation, and. Um, I, I would say, and so anyway, the point I was making with that is that my kids did not go to day school in Chicago. They only started going to day school when we moved here. Um, and so are there people who are not engaged in Jewish life? Absolutely. And I will tell you that I believe that the burden of that responsibility falls on Jewish community organizations um, for not helping people feel included, for not accepting Jews of other races and sexual identities for making it so hard and expensive to be Jewish 
And we have a responsibility, and I think our community has finally in the last decade or so opened our minds to seeing that Jews do not look like what we thought they looked like in 1980. And that if we want to make people feel welcome and included, we need to stretch our minds as Jewish communal organizations to be more inclusive and to help those people feel welcome. Because I can tell you, in 1990, if you were in an interfaith family, it was not so easy to, be able to feel part of a Jewish community um, in the same way that it is now. So I think we have a lot of work to do for, to make up for some past choices that historically Jewish organizations have made that have excluded people. Denise, would you diagnose the problem the same way that it's that the the reason we've been falling short is really because we haven't been as open and diverse and inclusive as we should be? Yes, I do agree with that. And I do think that part of also part of the work of the Jewish Community Relations Council and Federation is to um, open or widen the doors of the tent, so to speak. Um, when we're looking at diversity, we're not only talking about also Jews of color, we're talking about age, we're talking about individuals with differences, we're talking about uh, gender identity, we're, we're opening up, uh, broadening the tent for essentially everyone uh, to be included that is Jewish, and that is certainly a different perspective than has been in the past. And I do think that with the diversity, you also see a revival of very strongly of Judaism, people uh, learning things that they hadn't previously been aware of, for example, Pe people becoming interested in practices and rituals and Jewish life, however that looks for them and their family. So I, I agree with Audra wholeheartedly that has, that was, a, a very big problem that is clearly shifting and that has also made the Jewish community, I think, stronger. You mentioned the power of Jewish tradition and, and Jewish ritual. Can we, let's, let's talk about that for just a moment. So um, the world around us is more fractured, or it, it at least seems to be more fractured than ever. It's so ironic. We're so uber connected or we can be so uber connected to one another and yet the fractures i'm not sure there are more fractures but they seem just deeper than ever before is is jewish tradition is ritual a way to um build bridges and jewish teachings and jewish text is that and, and now you know for the federation and the jcrc that those you all have i think in large part stayed out of that realm there's a there has been a a delicate dance that's gone on for decades at least up in i remember when i was a congregational rabbi up in massachusetts this was a very delicate dance about you know we don't step on the federation's turf federation doesn't step on synagogue's turf just should the jcc have a have shabbat service you know all these different questions everyone kind of has their role um so understanding that this this isn't necessarily in the purview of federation or jcrc is Jewish tradition and our Jewish teachings vital in the future to building bridges when so many people not only feel disconnected from one another, but feel disconnected from those very traditions? Well, I would say definitely teachings. I mean, I don't know, definitely teachings. Let's even go, if we step outside of that, as a ritual, for example, Sabbat dinners or meals, um, those are a nice way. In fact, we've talked about quite often of having um, a, a soul Shabbat dinner, for example, with Jews and non-Jews. Um, that is a traditional aspect of Judaism that can definitely build bridges. Um, Shabbatones, that's a traditional uh, way of, of enjoying also Shabbat and learning and, and connecting. So I do, or when we have our events, the, the food is kosher. The food is kosher uh, sometimes, or not all, I, I'm not sure. I don't want to say something wrong, Audrey, but usually they say hamotzi. Um, you know, they're, they're, you can bring in those traditions that, that make people feel their identity. And it, there is a shift. There is a shift. And I am also, I guess, weird. There's a shift of sacredness 
at these times and, and during these moments. And, and that is what I think that makes it, aside from being just any other meal or any other event, if you bring in that aspect, whether it's lighting candles or it doesn't have to be um, extensive. It can be something just as, you know, just as small as someone saying hamotzi at an event. It will change the tone of everything. So we do those things. Uh, you know, we don't run surfaces clearly, but we do the, do those things and, and people enjoy them. Right. Audrey, did you want to <laughs> jump in at all? I think, I think Denise covered it well. <laughs> so there's a fantastic question that Bluma is asking. She says, how do federations deal with Jews? And when I would say federations, I would expand that to federation, JCRC, and all of the sub orgs that are part of it. Mm -hmm. How do federations deal with Jews who are strongly identified as Jewish, but are critical of Israel for a variety of reasons? Mm -hmm. So I have been very, very fortunate in this job that we have not had so much divisiveness in our community within the Jewish community in Broward. Um, I, I have a regular... Uh, weekly meeting with other CEOs around the country. And there are other federations, certainly, where they are dealing with very significant issues in their community that we haven't seen here. Um, teachers unions, newspapers, editorial boards, city councils, you know, voting for a ceasefire, calling out Israel, certainly in places where they have no influence um, to to affect Israel's decision making, but certainly creates opportunity of anti-Semitism. And there is a significant issue nationally um, within the progressive Jewish community. And I think it's, you know, it's human for all of us to acknowledge that what's going on in Israel now is difficult for all of us to watch. Um, I don't think any of us, you know, would say that we see it through a lens where um, it's it's 100 percent clear to us and easy to understand exactly the nuances of this war and, and how it plays out on the on the people in Gaza. But in this community, we have been particularly fortunate for whatever reason that there is a lot of unanimity within our community and our support and our love of Israel. And frankly, it was one of the things that one of the things that motivated me to, to return to South Florida. Um, is because there is a lot of solidarity here around those issues. So fortunately, it is not something in my career that I have had a lot of experience in managing. But again, it is very common throughout the country. Um, and it's just not something personally that I've, you know, thankfully had to deal with since October 7th. Denise, did you want to chime in at all? No, I agree. Broward County is extremely pro-Israel. There, there's there's no doubt about that. Um, and again, the meetings that I've had uh, where uh, issues have come up, they have not been um, meetings with Jewish leaders. They've been out and about in the community in general. Yeah, I guess the larger question though is is not just about Broward County, which is has unanimity, but you know, how do we as Jewish professionals and Jewish communal professionals, how do we we talked about diversity and inclusiveness before. Mm -hmm. I'm not feeling all that particularly inclusive at the moment of those people who are have a different opinion from me about what's happening in Israel. And, and mm -hmm. I think that's very natural for people. I'm not proud of the fact that I, I'm feeling less generous mm -hmm. of spirit than I, than I ever have in my entire life. So mm -hmm. how do we keep our doors open? How do we mm -hmm. keep our JCCs, our federations, our communal organizations open mm -hmm. to those who, for, uh, again, I, I don't mean to mm -hmm. judge their reasoning, but, but they just look at it very, very differently. Yeah. So I think it's an opportunity for us to be a best, our best version of ourselves and be open to being in dialogue with people because that's the only way you change hearts and minds. Now, listen, if we're talking with someone who's completely radicalized and not open to having a conversation, then in those situations, there's probably not much you can do. But I had the opportunity to travel to Israel a few weeks ago. And when I came home, I scheduled a Zoom with the 20 or so members of mine and my husband's extended family. And we certainly have a range of political perspectives on, you know, within our family. 
And everyone wanted to hear about my trip and they did ask some hard questions, but they were open to hearing the answers. And so I think if we're, if, if we want to be responsible about, um, you know, keeping people engaged in Jewish life, we have to be willing to have hard questions um, answered um, by people who are passionate, because that's the only way that you're able to change someone's beliefs. And if you can help someone understand a little bit more about the conflict, um, then I think it goes a long way. And, you know, it's not easy. Um, I have been in this field for 30 years, and I would say it's only within the last few years that I really feel truly comfortable that I have, a, you know, a deeper, intense understanding of what's going on in Israel. If I think about most of my friends um, and family, there's there's little uh, confidence in being able to have educated and informed decisions. So I think we have a responsibility as a community to help give people information um, so that they do feel like they can have those conversations with people, because otherwise, if we're not engaged in dialogue, no one's going to change their position ever. I agree. And generally, the way we approach it is just by focusing on what it is that we do agree upon and then uh, make sure that we leave the door open for that, which we do not. Um, that's usually the way that we approach that, whether it's within the Jewish community or outside of the Jewish community. So I want to push you a little bit on that, Denise, because of an experience that that we had here. And uh, the experience that I'm going to share is it's all hearsay. There's no I don't have any evidence of this. But here's what happened. We uh, and, and I'm asking you specifically because of your work with the Black Jewish Alliance. We were planning our annual Martin Luther King Shabbat. And every year we have a pastor from a black church and sometimes their choir come and be a part of our celebration. We couldn't get anyone this year. And uh, we were very concerned. People just were not calling us back. We were very worried that maybe um, the, uh, our feelings on Israel had created a breach. Um, now, the, the happy ending is last week, they all came and had lunch here. And there was sort of a gathering of, of those clergy, um, which thank goodness, it's wonderful. Is, 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 are, are you seeing that also, or is this an isolated uh, incident, or is this a, a point of, of real struggle for us, and will it be going forward? I'm seeing it, honestly, on both sides. I'm seeing events that we have uh, wanted to put on where um, the Jewish people are saying they no longer want to be involved because they don't feel supported by the African-American community. Um, I'm finding the African American community in general still wanting to collaborate, but as I expressed earlier, the meeting that I was at uh, this week, they want to know, they want to understand what's happening so that they can convey that to their uh, community, why they should still stand with the Jewish people when the, the, the issue that is being seen, I would, or the way that it's being presented in the media to African-Americans is that Palestinians are dark-skinned people who are being oppressed by lighter-skinned people. They're ju it's just a color differential. Uh, therefore- By the way, if anyone who's been to Israel knows that that's just <laughs> silly. But, no, uh, right. But if, if you've not been to Israel and if you uh, actually view uh, Jews as white, uh, that's the way that uh, your perception will be. So it's it's the oppressed and the oppressor. That's basically the way that it's being construed. But if you have that conversation about and go back historically, typically I find that people walk away having a sense of that makes sense to me. I, I can I can sit with you and I can have a conversation with you and I can even continue to support you. Um, but it's on both sides. It's not just because again, a lot of my progressive friends are very unhappy with the African American community. Yeah, no, that's very, very fair. Absolutely. So let me ask you then, so where do you see the black Jewish relations going 
in the next decade? What, what's next for us? What do we need to accomplish that we haven't yet? Uh, we've had a black Jewish Seder every year for the past 30 years, for goodness sakes. What else is there that we have yet to, to build together? Uh, all we have to do is to continue. That's the way that I, and not just wait for a crisis. This has to be a continuous and ongoing dialogue, monthly, weekly, whatever. Um, but it can't just be, uh, we have an issue, let's all band together. It has to be an ongoing conversation between the two communities, also so that there is the understanding, so that when you do have an Israel or you do have a George Floyd situation, um, that there is an understanding on 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 both sides of uh, what what it is that uh, that really honestly that we share in this country. And we're actually I'll have to do a plug here because we're actually going to the south and in, in April we'll do a trip to Selma and Birmingham, where the civil rights movement uh, really uh, awoke. I will say probably not the best wording. Um, between Martin Luther King and Rabbi Heschel, uh, this alliance between the Jewish community and the African American community with regard to civil rights is so successful and so historic that I actually don't think that the relationship will ever completely die, but you have to continuously rekindle it and remind people uh, of why it's so important for, for both communities. It's important for both communities. Being a Northeasterner, it's funny to hear someone in Florida say that we're going south to Selma. <laughs> I'm from the Northwest. Okay, so, all right, so there know, you go. I'm like, you know. <laughs> None of us are native to here. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So Audra, let me come to you. And and um, I, uh, I am terribly proud of the fact that I have spent meaningful and significant time in just about every movement of Judaism. I grew up typical conservative for high school and the beginning of college. I was very orthodox and from. Um, I went to the Reconstructors Rabbinical College for one year. I uh, work in reform synagogues. I, I've been all over the map and I can truly say that I, I it is a terrible blessing, a terrible in a good way, blessing that I've had all those experiences. I see beauty in all of them. Again, I'm strange. I think most people, for most people, trying to get these movements to work together is just, it's its like pushing that, that boulder up the mountain. But this is, as we said earlier, this is what Federation was born to do. It was born to find ways for communities to work together to build something bigger and greater. Can you talk a little bit about um, what that has looked like? And more importantly, what you imagine it will look like? How mm -hmm. is Federation and how are, not just Federation as an organization, but how are we as a Jewish community going to um, not let these differences in practice, in belief, stop us from becoming, as you said before, the best version of ourselves? Mm -hmm. So I'm definitely not any kind of expert in encouraging cooperation amongst the movements. Um, religious life, you know, is very much outside uh, of, of the zone of, of where we work, but we do bring people together across all different denominations and spaces to come together to celebrate community. And so, for example, we have a, a, a Broward Rabbinical Association where rabbis from all different kinds of organizations come together quarterly to learn together. Um, we work together to ensure that all of our Jewish communal organizations are safe. Um, we came together following the October 7th for a vigil. And so what we do is we look, we try to be open and inclusive to everybody and create a safe space where it's okay for everyone to come and interact in the same place. So whereas an Orthodox rabbi might not go to a reform shul on a, you know, for, for a service, um, the Federation is a place where they all feel that they can come together and be treated with respect. And there isn't that um, complexity of us being a, a religious organization to get in the way. So I, you know, I think that it's going to be incumbent upon everybody to continue to find spaces where we have shared goals 
um, I think focusing on security, on anti-Semitism, oh. on our kids. Um, these are places where we can come together and and talk and 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 help each other. And by the way, I just want to mention and I, correct me if I'm wrong, Kim or or Lila, but um, not next week, but the week after, Rabbi Yosef Weinstock from Young Israel, an Orthodox mm -hmm. rabbi, is joining us, and I'm so so happy mm -hmm. that we have. Orthodox representation. Uh, and he happens to be extraordinary. So he is he is one of our closest rabbinical partners. And he is an active participant in all of our programs, as are the members of a synagogue. You know, Broward's, Broward is the sixth largest Jewish community in the country. We have 180,000 Jews here. I don't think people realize just quite how large we are. And we're very diverse. But one of the areas where our community is growing significantly is in the modern Orthodox community. Um, and Rabbi Weinstock's shul and Brazzer Maimonides, which is the Orthodox Day School in Hollywood, um, which is at capacity, those communities are growing um, by leaps and bounds. And so that is a place where we are looking to build relations so that people are in relationship with each other. You know, if you live in Hollywood, your kids go to BMA and you go and you go to Young Israel, there's very little reason for you to leave your community unless you have a community perspective and you're looking for ways to engage. And so we have some of those people and we utilize them as a tool so that we can go to them, um, so that we can be present in their communities and, and help them understand the impact of collaboration and coming together. Denise, do you see a difference in how leaders or participants from the different movements uh, in Judaism engage in uh, intercommunal dialogue and intercommunal connection? And if you do, what needs to happen to, to make it more uh, uniform so that everyone, all members of the Jewish community are feeling that they can really be a part of that in a meaningful way? That's a very, that's a tough question. Um, my general sense is that if everyone is invited to the table and they have a genuine interest, they tend to show up. Um, now, do we all um, interact somewhat differently? Yes, clearly. Um, there, there are certain lines of, uh, you know, orthodox rabbis with women, or it's a bit different um, than um, some of the other denominations. But um, generally, most of what we have been able to do, and we pretty much do invite everyone, they will, they will show up. Um, and they will become quite engaged actually and a lot of them I will say are doing some tremendous work within within various aspects of the community in terms of fulfilling needs for example with within the the uh, the um, there are individuals with they, they're changing the wording it used to be with disabilities and now it's with differences so I'm trying to stay on top of the wording uh, but there are there is work being done by various facets, different denominations that is amazing throughout Broward, um, what, depending upon the space. So we definitely are able to kind of build those bridges as well. But, you know, the communities, they're, they're, they're different and that's, that's to be expected in, 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 in a sense, that's to be expected. But it's not that people aren't willing uh, to do the work and to do what's what's needed. I'm wondering if we could talk for just a moment about synagogues. And um, I, I, this may not be either of your areas of expertise, but I'm, I'm curious what you think. Uh, earlier on when we were talking about, I had suggested that you know, my synagogue wasn't doing a, a good enough job of shouting from the rooftops, hey, come over here because we're pro-Israel. Um, Henry, <clears throat> who was my alter ego, and I love desperately, um, wrote in the chat, many Jews were alienated from synagogues and Judaism during their bar bat mitzvah years, so they might not currently see synagogues as a refuge against anti-Semitism or as a place of solace. They see synagogues as part of the problem. 
that is so profoundly true. Um, and so my question is, how do we fix that? How can the Federation, how can the JCRC, how can our communal institutions help synagogues do better? Because in many ways, we're blowing it over here. We really are. And we so, need some help. And Go it, ahead, Audrey, it, sorry. it is not my ex area of expertise in any way. And truthfully, I don't see it as the role of the Federation. Um, I am deeply unimpressed by the national leadership of the movements and what they are doing to help synagogues revitalize themselves. And so unfortunately, I don't think that's a question where that's not, I don't have any professional expertise oh, no. in that area. Wait, no, wait, wait, wait. You just opened a can of worms, Audra. You can't, I'm not gonna let you back away now. I'm, I'm right there with you. And this is a part of, this has to be a part of our conversation about Jewish community. Where mm -hmm. are we failing? Where are we achieving? Where are we striving? Where are we struggling? And so if if the leadership of the movements is not doing their part, can it not be, I will just use Broward, for example, can it not be a part of the leadership of the Broward Jewish community to help, not financially, you all always help financially, that's not what I'm talking about, help mm -hmm. us do better. You know, I don't know that it's an area where we have a particular expertise and thought leadership where we would be where we would be sought after um, to play that role. Um, perhaps if we see that that's a need and a priority, it's an area that we that we could focus on. But but truthfully, it is so outside the realm of the federation system. And there are like you said, there are very clear dividers and, you know, sort of, you know, getting involved with the politics and the cooperation between synagogues and innovation isn't, a, you know, it's not exactly what we do. What we do do is, you know, we fund innovation. So if there are places that are doing extraordinary innovative things, if we can be thought partners in teacher training tomorrow, I'm going to uh, a preschool educators conference that we are throwing. Um, if there are going to be 500 early childhood educators at Temple Beth Emmett tomorrow for a half a day studying and learning together. So those are the ways we help to inspire and innovate change in Jewish life is certainly through synagogues. But that's, um, you know, in a very, in a very niche space. Uh, as a, one of my roles here is I run the preschool and I've been to well, one of those, con well, I've it been to one of those conferences and <laughs> talk about, talk about lack of diversity. I am the only man within 50 miles of that room of, right. of well, the preschool we're directors. Not, we're not paying our preschool directors enough and the field has become feminized and we need to pay our teachers more and what they deserve. Um, and we need to be encouraging both men and women to enter the field because it's amen, radically amen, amen. important that we have that in our educational system. I don't get it. Why would men not want to just play with kids all day? I don't get it. I don't know if you want to put it like that. It's I have to no, that's what I do. It's the best job in the world. I play with yeah. kids all day. They so well, that's a whole other conversation. Well, actually, that was last week's conversation about education. Um, Denise, what is your take on on the different movements and, and synagogue leadership and the role of JCRC in helping synagogues? You know, in, in many ways, synagogues are the first. I think that that people people find the synagogue more naturally than they find the Federation or JCRC, if for no other reason, because of life cycle events. Mm -hmm. And so we are the first line, right? People come to us. How can JCRC help us do better, do be that better work? I don't wanna sound, I, I hope this doesn't sound terrible, but uh, it's one of the basic things has just become more welcoming. You know, it's quite difficult to walk into a shul, a synagogue that you've not been to before, even as a Jew. So you can imagine uh, doing JCRC work at a synagogue. It's not easy. Um, I, I can't tell you how many times somebody's tried to block me out of a doorway. Um, it's just not a welcoming quite often unless somebody knows you or, know, you know. So it's the very basic kindness, I, seriously. And I, and I don't mean that in any, in any means disrespectful or condescending, but for people to feel that sense of, of community, there has to be 
a, a sense of, of warmth coming and welcoming when an individual walks through that door. And then they can go back and say, oh my gosh, I went to whatever uh, people were wonderful. It was such a great experience. Um, that doesn't happen often enough for many people. Um, that, that's just- so, Denise, yeah. what, what, so what do we do about that though? Because I, you know, I have books on my shelf about synagogue three two thousand synagogue three thousand and and you know relational Judaism and I mean I, we've been writing books and reading books and studying this and talking about this for decades and we're not it we're not we're getting a little better we are getting a little better but we're not getting enough better so what is I mean what does the future hold for us if we can't that basic kindness mm -hmm. if we're still struggling with that. Well, I, I, again, I, it's, it's, there are certain communities that, uh, you know, that, that do offer that. I have been in, in several, for example, young Israels that were very warm and welcoming and, and, and loving. And I've been in other uh, different types of shuls that, that simply were not. And I, and I do think that as understanding our, our diversity certainly helps um learning to simply i'm going to say fake it until you make it if you see somebody and you're not so sure just pretend like you are right just don't say oh my god jewish not jewish what's happening here just smile help the person um that's it that's it's it's really and and i do think that because the winds are changing um and because Pete, there is um a deep desire for people to connect now more than ever, that just to give that individual the benefit of the doubt as to, you know, why they're stepping through that door um, and, and being, you know, exhibiting chesed and, and just being loving and kind and that's it. I, I don't think that that's, it's so Jewish. Why can't yeah. it happen? <laughs> not too heavy of a lift. Yeah. Loba shamaimi. It's not in the heavens. All right. It's time for the lightning round. Uh, and here's what I'd like to know. Your recipe for the future of Jewish community. There, there are no, no budget limits, no, no um, government, you know, there's no um, bureaucracy that you have to deal with. You can imagine what the future of Jewish communal life looks like. What's on your wish list? What's a, what's in your recipe for us? I'm gonna Audrey. I'm gonna pick on you first. Mm. Audra, sorry, I said Audrey. I think every Jewish child needs to have a Jewish summer camp experience, um, and I think that honestly is the solution <laughs> because it creates a safe space to be Jewish, to be with your friends, to have fun, and it makes Judaism an ex an experience that creates power and community and not one where you have to be in school and you have to sit in temple and you can't talk and you have to read a book that's in a language that you can't read. So if, 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 if we could require every Jewish child to have to have a Jewish overnight experience, Judaism would be so much more joyful for them. And it would be, they would have warm feelings towards their, um, towards their faith and, be engaging in Jewish life would be something that adds value rather than seems like a drag. I love that one. All right, you're up, Denise. I would add a trip to Israel for every <laughs> for everyone. Uh, in addition to that, um, understanding the the history is is absolutely vital. Uh, anyone who goes Jewish or or non comes back a, a different person. Um, it, it, it's very, very important. So I think the combination of, of, of the two is, is invaluable. Um, Denise, you just reminded me. So I was rabbi of a synagogue in the Boston area for 20 years. And one year, I don't know why this happened, but one year, um, a dear friend of mine who worked at the Federation called me and he said, David, if you had, I forget what the number was, $20,000, $25,000, what would you do? I said, anything? He said, yeah. I said, I would take all of my eighth graders to Israel. A week later, I had $20,000 in the bank. 
from the Federation. And I took all of my eighth graders to Israel that year. And it was so it's such a profound moment. And I, I don't like to reduce Federation to finances because it's so much more than that. It's so fundamental to the building of Jewish community. And in that moment, those funds made all the difference. It had a real impact. And by the way, there were only nine kids. So this was Federation taking $20,000 or whatever the number was, I forget, and complete subsidizing the entire trip for nine children and two adults. It was very small and focused, but talk about impact. Holy moly, it was just fantastic. Mm -hmm. Well, now it would cost about one hundred and fifty thousand dollars <laughs> to take nine kids and two chaperones to Israel. So make it was your a gift lot. to our federation so we can send more kids to Israel because that's what we do. We fund birthright. We fund eighth grade Israel trips. We fund Masa. We make we make it happen. So honeymoon in Israel. <laughs> we need your money to, to send all those kids to Israel. My daughter's in, in the IDF right now over in Israel, and she just wrote me. She said, "You know what I really want to do? I really want to be on. I want to go on birthright." Because apparently when you're a service member, you can request, yeah. apparently e everyone requests this gig, apparently. So she's going to yeah. request it to yeah. be security every, for birthright. Every birthright bus in Israel has two soldiers with it, and they have the experience together so that the yeah. Americans understand what it's like to be an 18 or a 19-year-old kid in Israel with a machine gun strapped around your back. Yeah. <laughs> Unbelievable. Um, Denise and Audra, this was such an honor talking with both of you. Such a pleasure, really. I'm, I'm so, so grateful for your time, for your expertise, and, and just for sharing and for helping us build community, because that's really what IJKL is, is here to do also. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to our, our fearless leader over there. And uh, <laughs> Yes, thank you, Dave. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Denise. Thank you, Audra. And thank you, David, our amazing moderator. Thank you everyone who came today. Uh, we're so excited for next week. We're gonna have a session about Israel. So it is gonna be interesting and powerful and meaningful. So don't miss it. We'll see you next week. Thank you everyone for coming. We're gonna send the recording. I hope this time worked perfectly. I'm sure it will. Thank you everyone. Have a great Shabbat. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you.